It is so good to see those of you that are back again this evening. Our sermon this evening is actually the continuation of the sermon we began this morning. For those of you that weren't here this morning, we're going to go back and show you some key verses. We started off with Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. What I'm beginning today is an in-depth study into exactly from the scriptures how it is that we are saved. This one verse right here pretty much lays it out. And this is in the Old Testament. This is in Proverbs. How that atonement, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. There needed to be an atonement for sin. The atonement you're going to find when you get to the New Testament was accomplished through Christ crucified. And so for God to show mercy for our sins to be able to be forgiven, that was accomplished through Christ crucified. And then he also says uh, that in mercy and truth. We talked about the mercy and the grace this morning. You'll find over in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in John 1, 17, uh, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so we try to point out in the sermon this morning, for there to be atonement for sin from God's end, there had to be Christ crucified, a means through which sins could be forgiven through the power of the blood of the Christ. And so that is the way in which mercy is able to come to man. But mercy is where you're seeking forgiveness. Grace is where God is showering us with spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And we learn from the lesson this morning that we're indeed saved by grace through faith. But I want you to notice also, not only did mercy and grace come through Jesus Christ, but also truth, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Our sermon this evening is going to be a study of truth coming through Jesus Christ. This is absolutely crucial to understand how we are saved, how we are born again, how God dwells in us, all the lessons we're going to be going from after this all come back to this one. All come back to how the truth came through Jesus Christ. We're going to start the lesson by trying to help you understand how we got the Bible. How we got the Word of God. First of all, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16-17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What I want you to see primarily is what I put in yellow tent for you. All Scripture, Old and New Testament, all Scripture is inspired of God. All Scripture starts with God the Father. Going further with this, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 3-6. through six. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So what God wants us to do, he wants all men to be saved. And the way this is going to be done is by coming to the knowledge of the truth. Do you see that? He wants all men to be saved. So the way men, all men are going to be able to be saved is directly connected to all men coming to the knowledge of the truth. How did we get the truth, the word of God? It comes from God through the mediator, Jesus Christ. John 17, 17 very precisely says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. God's word starts with God the Father. It is the truth. And then in Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. All I'm wanting you to see, something you already knew, okay, but I'm wanting you to see this because this is crucial. The word of God starts with God the Father. All scripture starts with God the Father. Then the new covenant is given through Jesus Christ, the mediator. Remember what we learned earlier? There's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, 
Now, when you go over to John chapter 18 on the outline, verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus came into the world for a purpose, to bear witness and to tell us what the truth is. And look at the very last part of this. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What we do to the truth is how we determine whether or not we are going to be saved or lost. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. You find over in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6 where he says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also as a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. What we mean by that is all revelation starts with God the Father and then goes through Jesus the Christ. And we'll say that again because you've got to get this in your mind. All revelation begins with God the Father and goes through in the new covenant, Jesus the Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. Again, Hebrews 9 and 15. <clears throat> And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, but you need to understand this. Every sin that God is going to forgive is going to be the same way through the blood of the Christ. Everybody that's going to be saved, whether it be in the patriarch, mosaic, or Christian dispensation, are all going to be saved the same way, by grace through faith. But the new covenant, Jesus is the mediator of it. He is the second part of the Godhead, if you will, to whom the truth comes to us. Go on, go to Luke's account, chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is one of those texts where you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one being baptized. It's crucial to recognize when this happens to Jesus. It happens to Jesus when he is baptized. It is after he is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove and lights upon him. This is the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. This is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Everything he does, everything he says, is through this power coming upon him at this moment. Let that sink in. He is doing nothing of his own authority. He is saying nothing of his own authority. He is doing and speaking the word and will of God and doing the will of God. But where it all starts is the Holy Spirit coming upon him. And then God the Father says, you are my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. I'm going to make several points about this, but you've got to understand this. This is where the ministry of Jesus begins. When he is baptized and the Holy Spirit comes upon him. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. Do you see that? Jesus, even when he is speaking, what we have here in the New Covenant, he is not speaking of his own authority. He is speaking what God the Father is speaking to him and revealing to him through the Holy Spirit. Please follow that. That's how revelation is given. God the Father through the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Christ being the one speaking it here. He's not speaking of his own authority. Everything that he's saying comes from God the Father. All truth spoken and revealed to us comes from God the Father. Again in John 14 and verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The word that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Oh, man. <laughs> I, I, I could spend a whole lot on this. And we're going to come back to this, by the way, later on. But this is the text where Jesus starts talking about God being him and him and God, and him being one with God. And we're going to have a whole lesson on that, brethren. 
But I want you to see what he says here. The words that I speak, I do not speak of my own authority. Jesus is a mouthpiece of God the Father through the Holy Spirit. That's the way the revelation was given when Jesus was speaking. The Father, Holy Spirit, Son, all involved in giving the revelation. Oh, by the way, I want to go back to one other thing. He says, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. All the miracles Jesus did was God working through him. All the words that you taught was God speaking through him. And the way in which it was done was through the Holy Spirit. Now then, 2 Peter, chapter 1, 20 through 21. Knowing that first, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All right. God the Father and the New Covenant, Jesus is the mediator of it, and then the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all involved in the giving of the truth, the Word of God. John 16, 20, uh, 13 through 15. However, when he, the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So we're talking about how the apostles and prophets were able to speak and write what they spoke and wrote. It was going to be through the Holy Spirit guiding them. It says, for he will not speak of his own authority. So the Holy Spirit's not speaking of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. And so revelation, God the Father, the mediator, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, who revealed it to the apostles and prophets. John 16, 13 through 15. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So again, the Holy Spirit is not speaking of his own authority. He's going to glorify Christ. And what Christ reveals to the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit reveals to the apostles and prophets. Are you seeing the chain of authority? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, apostles and prophets. That's how we got the new covenant. That's how we got the truth. Now Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. How that by revelation you made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. All right, saying the same thing over and over. Revelation, how did the apostles and prophets receive it? Through the Holy Spirit. Starts with God the Father, through the mediator Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit, who gave it to the apostles and prophets, they wrote it down. And we can read it, and we can understand it. Again, you may think, well, I already know all of that. Okay, good. Now it's impressed even stronger in your mind because you've got to realize it is by the fact the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all involved in the giving of the word of truth that is crucial to you understanding later on the indwelling of God and how it's done. Just giving you some previews of coming attractions. But right now, this is where I want to slow down. Now you understand how we got the word, how we got the truth. There's something you've got to understand about the truth, the word of God. It is not like my library books that I have in my office. It is not the word of man. It is the word of God. And as the word of God it is living. It is powerful. John 6, 63 is one of the more important verses to me on this subject. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. I have shown you all this verse before. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you before, but this is a crucial lesson. You've got to get it nailed down to understand what I'm going to be teaching you. There are three things we learn from this particular verse. Number one, there's a direct connection between the Holy Spirit and the Word. You already know that. Number two, though, is that there's a direct connection between the Holy Spirit and eternal life. There's a direct connection between the Holy Spirit and our in the future having eternal 
life. It is the Spirit who gives life. The words that I speak to you are spirit. They are life. What kind of life is he talking about? Eternal life. And so since there's a direct connection between the Holy Spirit and the Word, and there's a direct connection between the Holy Spirit and eternal life, there's a direct connection between the Word of God and eternal life. Yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to teach you. There's a direct connection between the Word of God and your having eternal life. In that same chapter of John 6, 68, but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Direct connection between you and I and anyone who's going to have eternal life and the words being spoken through Jesus the Christ. The way it's put over in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, such an important verse. For the word of God is living and Powerful. And we'll say that one more time because I'm wanting it to sink in. The Word of God is living. It's a living Word. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. Look at this last part. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word can tell what kind of soil you are. The Word can tell what kind of heart you have. The Word is the divider. The divider. The discerner. He talks about division between soul and spirit. And then he talks about it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's you. My thoughts. My intents. What kind of soil am I? If you don't understand what I'm talking about. In the parable of the sower... You have the wayside soil, you have the rocky ground, you have the thorny ground, you have the good ground. Whenever the seed hits the wayside, the birds of the air take it away. Whenever it hits the rocky ground, they receive it for a while and it grows and because of the rocks, then it, it dies out. When it hits the thorny ground, it grows for a while and the thorns choke it out. The good ground receives the seed and then it grows and it bears fruit. What's that talking about? It's talking about different kind of people. It's the same seed. It's the same Word of God. The living and powerful Word of God. But it hits some individuals and it does nothing to them. Why? Because they're not the good ground. It discerns what kind of individual you are. And it separates, if you will, the lost from the saved. It all comes down to this, putting it more succinctly. Your being saved is all determined on how you respond to the truth. You got that? Your being saved is all dependent on how you respond to the truth of the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 to 23. We're going to come back to this verse several times. Since you have purified your soul in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Lord willing, next week I'm going to give you an entire sermon on how to be born again. From over in John chapter 3, you must be born again, born of the water, born of the Spirit. Well, right here we're going to be seeing, we're going to come back to this verse next week, how it's done, how it is you're born again. Not corruptible seed. In physical birth is what's contrasted with spiritual birth. Physical birth is the egg of your mother, the seed of your father, but they have to come together. If they don't come together, there's no life. For there to be spiritual life, eternal life. Born again life. The heart must receive the seed into the heart. If you can get that in your mind, you have got one of the main lessons I'm going to try to teach you through this whole series. It all comes down to what you do with the incorruptible Word of God. The seed, let it come in.
to the heart. And notice again what it says about it. The word of God that lives. Remember living? Living and powerful. It lives and abides for how long? Forever. There's a direct connection between you receiving the word of God and being born again. You receiving the word of God and becoming a child of God. And through that, having eternal life. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. All right. Here it is again. The word of God is living. The word of God is powerful. It is through the gospel of Christ that whoever is going to be saved is going to be saved. Let me explain it to you this way. By God's great love and through God's great love, he's willing to show mercy and grace to us. And this mercy and grace is shown to us through Christ crucified. How would you know about God's love without the word? How would you know the truth about God without the word? How would you know about Christ crucified without the word? How would you know he's the son of God without the word? The answer is, you got nothing without the word. Nothing. The word is absolutely necessary to access the mercy and the grace of God because it is through you, you learn about God, you learn about his great love for you, you learn about who Jesus is, you learn that he died for your sins with burial and rose again the third day, and it is through that word that every person who's going to be saved is going to be saved. There is no Christian without the seed. There's no Christian without the seed of the word of God. And it all comes down to this. Are you going to receive the seed of the word of God and let it produce faith? Remember the close of our lesson this morning? You are saved by grace through faith. Crucial to understand. How does faith come? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There it is. That's all I'm trying to get you to. We are saved by grace through faith. You are not hit with irresistible grace forcing you to believe. That doesn't happen. The way every believer comes to the point of faith is through the word of God. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are recorded for a reason. So you can read about the virgin birth. So you can read about the miracles Jesus did. So you can read about his crucifixion. So you can read about his resurrection. And as you read these things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, using your reasoning, opening your heart, opening your mind, and realizing he really is the Christ. He really is the Son of God. Please realize this. Those of you that believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that's how you got there. You received the seed into your heart. You believed it. You let it produce faith. And it is by that faith that it produced everything else is going to be accomplished. Everything. What is it you confess? Your faith. How is it you're able to repent? By your faith. Why is it you are baptized? By your faith. How is it you live and walk after you obey the gospel? By faith. Where the faith comes from is the truth. Mercy, the mercy of God came through Jesus. The grace of God came through Jesus. The truth of God came through Jesus. To access the mercy and the grace, you have to receive the truth. You receive the truth, you let it produce the faith, and then by that faith you obey the gospel. Remember what we read earlier? They purify their souls by doing what? Obeying the truth. Does that mean you're earning it? No. You're not earning it. I haven't earned anything when I obeyed the gospel. I'll put it to you another way, very simply. In the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 5, you've got a man who's named Naaman. He's got leprosy. And uh, the prophet speaks to him, God speaking through the prophet, tells him to go down to the Jordan River and dip himself seven times. 
And so when Naaman finally consents and goes down and dips himself in the Jordan River seven times and his leprosy is washed away, did he earn that leprosy being washed away? Well, no. God removed the leprosy when he did what God said do. When we obey the gospel, I'm not earning my salvation. Even when I do the works of Christianity, I'm not earning my salvation. But you have to understand this. For you to have faith, where the faith you have comes from, is through the living, powerful Word of God that was given to us by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Revealed to the apostles, they wrote it down, we read it, we believe it, and then we live by it. That's what's giving you access to the grace of God by which you're saved. We are indeed saved by grace through faith. But where our faith comes from is the living, powerful truth of the Word of God. We're just getting started, folks. This is the very opening introduction. As I told you as we go into this, we're going to come back and we're going to have a whole lesson on being born again. And uh, then we're going to have some lessons on God and us and us and God. And then we're going to study how it is we have eternal life. By the way, you've got, you've got all these tonight. You can come back to a lot of these same verses. But we're going to expound on all of them to try to nail it down to where you can see in the end how it is that we are saved by the mercy and the grace of God and from our end, living and walking by faith. And what is entailed and involved in a life that lives and walks by faith. I hope you come back and hear the rest of this series. How many is going to be? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't finished yet. I'm still studying. And uh, last night I was about to 10 o'clock, and uh, yeah, it just kind of keeps expanding. So we'll just see when I'm finished. But if there's anybody here tonight who's not a Christian yet, and you have come to the point of having your own faith, I can tell you how I got there. You've heard the word of God preached, or you've listened to it, or you've read it. And at some point in time, you went, it's true. It happened. He really is the Christ. The virgin birth did take place. He really is the son of God. Not only that, he really died for my sins. He really rose from the dead. If you are at that point and you haven't obeyed the truth yet, come confess your faith. Openly confess what you believe about Jesus. Driven by your faith, make the commitment of repentance, that is to follow the word of God, to put off sin, to put on Christ, and to be transformed in the image of Christ. It's a lifelong commitment and a lifelong journey. The biggest commitment of your life. But if you're willing to confess your faith and make the commitment of repentance, we'll be glad to assist you and baptize you into the body of Christ for the remission of your sins. You're not earning anything, but this is the way you access the mercy and the grace of God. It's through obeying the truth. If you're in Christ already and there's sin between you and your God, God has made a means through which that sin is dealt with. We take the sin to God, we confess it to him, and we turn from it. We'll pray for you, we'll pray with you, we'll do the best we can to encourage you and strengthen you. If you are subject to the gospel call in any way, let us know. I'll be standing and sing the song you've been selected.